In its day, a century ago, the Lusitania was one of the fastest and finest passenger ships in the world. Sadly, we only remember it today because it was attacked 100 years ago this May by a German U-boat. The ship carried almost 2,000 passengers, and here to tell us about their fate is Eric Larson. He's the author of a new book called Dead Wake, The Last Crossing of the Lusitania, and we are happy to welcome you to TVO. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Well, besides the fact that this is the 100th anniversary of this tragedy, what propelled you to write about this book? Well, you know, it, it had always, I, I've always had a maritime thing. I mean, I've always, you know, the, the romance of ships, Titanic, you know, ever since I was a kid, the Flying Dutchman, the whole deal. Um, but e even so, I mean, the Lusitania kind of felt to me almost like too obvious a story for a while until I started doing some advanced reading and suddenly realized that, you know, there's so much more to the story than I had ever thought I knew. Like when I was in high school, you know, this is probably where I first encountered the Lusitania. It was just like a, some dusty little node on a high school timeline, you know, a geopolitical event leading up to, uh, you know, uh, uh, up to World War I. But as soon as I started reading about it, I realized, you know, the, the thing here is this was a, a major human tragedy. And I can tell you the first fact that just sort of lit my imagination, which was that, that during the actual sinking, a fully loaded lifeboat while it was being launched, fell on top of another fully loaded lifeboat. And I was like, wow, that was sort of revelatory to me. You we know? are going to get to that. Don't get yeah. too far ahead of me. All right. Oh. Let's, uh, let's start with this, because obviously we have a lot of new Canadians who watch this program who may not know the history of this, even though it's a well-known moment in history. Uh, so let's start with the ship itself. Describe okay. it for us. Uh, well, first of all, it was, in fact, the largest, fastest, most glamorous ocean liner then in service, and we need to qualify that by saying, you know, because it's in service, I mean, there were actually larger ships, um, but the British, uh, the Admiralty had commandeered some of those ships to turn them into troop transports, and the great German liners had all been sequestered or interned in neutral harbors because the Germans did not want the British Navy capturing their own ocean liners and turning them into so-called armed auxiliary cruisers. So the Lusitania was the best, biggest, fastest show in town. To give you a, an index of, of how glamorous it was, if you were in first class, you could actually, you could actually book a stateroom that had a wood-burning fireplace. <laughs> well, With I think that. I remember reading somewhere that it cost was was Vanderbilt's ticket a thousand dollars, and which is twenty two thousand by today's yeah, money? Yeah, it was. Only, yeah, by but by, by today's standards, yeah, about twenty two grand. Twenty two grand to take a ship across the ocean from right. New York to the United Kingdom. Right. That's right. an expensive ticket. It's an expensive ticket. Okay. Yep. The captain was a guy named William Turner. Tell us about him. William Thomas Turner. He was a captain of the old school. He had come up from being a cabin boy as a kid, and he'd come up through the, uh, you know, through the hard knock world of being a sailor on on square rig ships. Uh, eventually made the transition to steamboats with Cunard. Um, I think he's the kind of guy you'd want as a captain. He was a veteran captain. I mean, really well thought of at Cunard. Um, was Cunard's always the company that this is Cunard Steamship Company. Mm -hmm. um, he was the man who was always given the uh, you know con command of of the the biggest best ships that Cunard had. Here. It's funny, we talk about the Lusitania, but you can't talk about the Lusitania without talking about the other ship, right. which is the submarine, the German U-boat called the U-20. Right. And here's how you describe submarine life at that time. The boats were cramped, especially when first setting out on patrol, with food stored in every possible location, including the latrine. Vegetables and meats were kept in the coolest places among the boat's munitions. Water was rationed. If you wanted to shave, you did so using the remains of the morning tea. No one bathed. Fresh food quickly spoiled. Whenever possible, crews scavenged. One U-boat dispatched a hunting party to a Scottish island and killed a goat. It doesn't sound like state-of-the-art technology, but I guess it was at the time, wasn't well, it? Well, at the time, it was yeah. very definitely state-of-the-art technology. But today, it doesn't sound like much to much to us. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a, 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 a cramped and dangerous life being in a in a submarine. And its captain was a guy named Walther. Is it Schwiga? Is that Schwiger. how you say it? Schwiga. Although although um, I did hear an interview um, at the Imperial War Museum where a colleague of his after the war referred to him as Schweiger. So hmm. it's not spelled Schweiger. It's spelled Schwiga. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There he is. What kind of a captain was he? Uh, he was an interesting guy. He's a young guy, much younger than Captain Turner. Uh, he was uh, thirty. Um, and he was a very handsome guy. 
uh, had a good sense of humor. He was very well liked by his crew. Um, and he was well liked throughout the submarine service. In fact, uh, one of his colleagues, one of his fellow uh, submarine commanders referred to him once as saying, uh, said of him once uh, that he couldn't hurt a fly. <laughs> Uh, yes, he could and did. <laughs> Maybe not a fly, but yeah. Yeah, lots of people. Let's now focus on this final voyage. The ship starts in New York. It is aiming for the United Kingdom. Did it have it? Now, admittedly, we're in the you know, second year of World War I at this point. Ten months in. Ten months in. Having said that, did the Lusitania have any reason to think it would be a target? You have to put yourself back in the, in the sort of the point of view of of the day, you know, POV, as screenwriters like to say. Um, it was a very fast, very big ship. And one of the prevailing opinions was that it was too big and too fast to ever be caught by a submarine. The second element of this, this perception was that um, uh, maritime warfare up until this point had been governed, maritime warfare against civilian shipping, had been governed by, uh, uh, orchestrated by a, by a, by a set of, uh, uh, of agreed on rules, the so-called cruiser rules or prize law, which forbade attacks on civilian ocean liners, civilian you know, passenger liners. Um, so you had that, that element of, of this, this is why people thought it'd be fine, it'd be fine to. It's fast to, and there's rules, so we're, we should be rules. okay. We should be okay, right, right. In fact, I think, who was it? One guy sent a telegram back home saying, this is a stupid and uneventful trip I'm on. Well, that, was, that, was a young, that was a young woman. It wasn't a telegram. It was a letter that she, she uh, yeah, it was a note. It, during, during the voyage, she actually wrote, uh, she said, yes, this is the most uneventful and stupid voyage. <laughs> Not for long. She was a spunky little character. I really liked her. Hmm. I liked her. Did the Lusitania know before the U-20's torpedo hit it that that torpedo was coming for them and they were under attack? Well, the thing about torpedoes was that they left a very clear compressed air track on the surface of the sea, and in particular on the day of this attack. To set the stage, this day, this was May 7th, uh, 1915, um, the fog had somewhat miraculously cleared, leaving the most beautiful of days, a warm spring day, with no wind, the sea was absolutely glass smooth in a way that nobody could recall it actually seeing it before. And that's when the torpedo uh, was launched and became, began heading towards Lusitania in full view of passengers. Passengers could see this thing coming. Uh, rather incredulous watching it, but here was this torpedo track on this beautifully smooth sea coming right at the Lusitania. What do you know about how they reacted when they saw it coming? Well, there were lots of different reactions. I mean, one, one, uh, one man was watching, and, and a woman, woman came up to him and said, is that, is that a torpedo? And he just couldn't answer because he just felt so, so like, sick at heart that this thing was happening. Another man, you know, this was 1915, and God bless him, this guy, this guy he goes to the rail um, and uh, leans over so he can watch the torpedo as it makes impact, <laughs> you know? Um, and he, he said of it, he said this was, it was a beautiful sight. Well, that's the odd thing. I gathered, depending on where you were on the ship, y you either were dead right away or you, well, barely yes. knew, you barely knew it. Well, that's right. It was so big. The ship was so big, so, so built to flex to a degree mm -hmm. that when the torpedo hit, I mean, those, those who were right behind the point of impact in the hull, unfortunately, consist a lot of them were, were, many of the crew were killed instantly by this torpedo. But if you, were, um, if you were standing at the stern, let's say, um, you would have felt, you would have had minimal feeling that, that there had been this, this catastrophic explosion against the hull. Just to give people a sense of how big this ship is, again, another statistic I think I remember. Shifts of 100 men shoveling the coal into the burners to make this thing move. Yeah, yeah. 100 men yeah. per shift. Yep, four, four, uh, four boiler rooms with, with immense boilers and, and furnaces, and the ship uh, used up 1,000 tons of coal a day in, in, mm. during the crossing, all of it shoveled and you know, trimmed, quote unquote, by, uh, by hand, manual labor. So there was some time between people seeing the torpedo coming and the right. actual impact. Did right. Captain Turner do anything to avoid impact? 
Captain Turner was in no position to, to do anything because he was actually not even on the bridge at that point. He was, he was returning to the bridge and happened to, and saw the track actually from, uh, from the opposite side, side of the ship. Saw it in such a way, by the way, that as did many, that um, if you can picture this, the, the track um, uh, for a few moments disappeared from view because you think if you're standing on one side of the deck, um, here's the other end of the deck, and you're watching this thing on the water. It, it passes under your, out of your sight, of your, your, your line of sight. And for, um, for a while, the people were sort of, they kind of indulged the, the delusion that it was not going to explode. It was a dud. And then suddenly this big, big explosion. So he was on, he was on the deck. Um, he was not able to do anything to, to, try to, to try to use the ship's great agility. And it was a very agile ship to try to avoid or, or mitigate the impact. Agile, but again, if we saw that, I don't know if, Sheldon, it's possible to put that first picture back up. You can see four smokestacks on the ship. Right. But they only ran three for some reason. Yes. How come? This is, this is a they big... They weren't going as fast as they could have been going. Well, this is a big part of the story. Although, first though, what is very important to know is that the ship at this point, when it was torpedo, was going at 18 knots, which is still very fast for any kind of ship in that in that era. Could have gone 26, though. Could have gone 25 or 26, yes. And, and the reason it, it, it was not in a position to do so at that point, it had, it had four boiler rooms. As an economy measure, Cunard had decided to take one of those boiler rooms out of operation, um, effectively reducing the maximum speed by four knots. Now you think, well, that's not, that's not so significant. But in fact, it added a full day to the voyage. And that full day, as it happens, was, was, was fairly, fairly crucial. But also, at, at the point of impact with the sub, where the submarine and the ship met each other in the Irish Sea, yes, if all four boiler rooms had been operating, um, it could have achieved speeds of 25 or 26 knots. Um, whether that would have helped at, at that point or not, um, I don't think so, because um, Schwieger was set up in such a way that he had a perfect shot. Here's yeah, and, he, and because of a fairly fluky set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Here is how the U-boat commander described the sinking, according to your book. There was a terrific panic on her deck. Overcrowded lifeboats, fairly torn from their positions, dropped into the water. Desperate people ran helplessly up and down the decks. Men and women jumped into the water and tried to swim to empty, overturned lifeboats. It was the most terrible sight I have ever seen. It was impossible for me to give any help. I could have saved only a handful. And then the cruiser that had passed us was not very far away and must have picked up the distress signals. She would shortly appear, I thought. The scene was too horrible to watch, and I gave orders to dive to 20 meters and away. When Schwiege gave the order to fire on the Lusitania, did he know he was about to attack a passenger as opposed to a military vessel? If you read his war log, which is where that excerpt came from, if you read his war log, and, that was, and it's, it's an amazing document, by the way, just full of very interesting details. Where is it now? Um, it's, it's in a number of archives, but the main, the main original copy is in the archives of the United Kingdom, National Archives of the United Kingdom. Um, the, the, refresh me, where, where, where were we going this? Did he know he was attacking a passenger ship? Right. The war log suggests that he did not. Hmm. However, among historians, there is this consensus that he had to have known, that possibly that particular passage was added to the log after the fact. Hmm. Because the Lusitania had a very well-known silhouette, well-known to, to, to seagoing folk. Four stacks, very distinctive shape, hard to believe that he couldn't have known it, especially also since at midnight, Every night, the uh, German transmitter at Nordeich um, sent wireless messages to ships and submarines notifying them of the coming and going, comings and goings of uh, Cunard ships, among them the Lusitania. Mm. And this, these also further were waters where you know, all Cunard ships passed, and among them, of course, the Lusitania. His, was it his wife or his girlfriend who said he couldn't have known he wouldn't hurt a fly, this guy? Well, it, 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 his girlfriend said that he was so, he, he was so shattered by the whole incident that, that he just wanted to go home and never fire another torpedo. Now, 
Uh, it's nice that she said that, but it was uh, it's true. immediately contradicted because no sooner did he sink the Lusitania than he went after another ship. Now, he happened to miss. His, his torpedo either malfunctioned or who knows what happened, which is common with torpedoes, by the way. Um, and that, too, was a liner. So, you know, put it together, he, I don't think he had any particular remorse. There's a lot of bad luck that goes into the sinking of this ship, right? I mean, you just yes. told us about, I think I <clears throat> think the statistic was 60% of the shots that that you boats took malfunctioned. Yes. So you've got a perfectly calm day, the fog went away, they're only using three burners instead of four, and uh, it doesn't malfunction. He gets a perfect shot off. Right, right, right. So uh, these poor folks, boy, a lot of things had to go wrong for them to die. A, a lot of things had to go wrong. And not only that, not only that, Schweiger, Schweiger when he was, um, when he was uh, you know, lining up his shot against the Lusitania, he had estimated that the speed of Lusitania was faster than it actually was. Hmm. And possibly because, I mean, just, just interpreting that, possibly because he did, in fact, recognize that it was the Lusitania and knew that it could achieve very, very fast speeds. So he miscalculated the speed, uh, which meant that not only did the torpedo, I mean, the, when, when the torpedo hit this particular spot on the hull, which was the sweet spot, probably the one place on that hull that would guarantee destruction of this ship so quickly in 18 minutes that it would sink, hmm. um, he hit it by accident. 139 Americans died on that ship. Almost 10 times as many Brits did, and yet somehow this is remembered as an American tragedy. More on that in a second. If you wanted to participate in World War I, you could not get a better pretext than 139 American passengers just killed on the open seas by, the, by a German U-boat commander. And yet, the Americans take another two years before they get into World War I. How come? Yeah. yeah. That was one of, the, one of the things that surprised me. I, I had sort of bought the whole mythology that it was kind of like World One's version of Pearl Harbor. The main reason we didn't, um, uh, uh, well, not, not the main reason we didn't go into the war, but, but you know, the fact is people didn't want this to be a cause for America joining the war. You know, there was an interesting survey done of, uh, of newspaper editors up in, in the day and newspaper editors were the main source of public opinion. And none of them, none of them wanted to go into the war. I mean, there, there were a few probably who did. And there were those who, 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 who did feel this was cause enough, like Teddy Roosevelt and his crowd. The vast majority of Americans, as best anybody can tell, you know, there were no public opinion surveys at this point, um, wanted not to go into the war. And among those, of course, was President Wilson himself. Well, I was just, just going to say, let's remind everybody, Teddy Roosevelt is not the president now. Woodrow right. Wilson is the president now. Woodrow there he Wilson, is. Yes. Is he so helplessly in love with his soon-to-be second wife at this point that he kind of loses the ball? Yeah, you know, uh, I love this part of the story because here, here, is, here is Wilson. Um, in August of 1914, the month the, the war began, he lost his wife of many years. Um, and he was deeply lonely and, 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 and just absolutely grief struck. Comes 1915, uh, he falls in love with a Washington widow, 40 something Washington widow, um, uh, frequently seen riding around town in her electric car. He falls head over heels in love with her. I mean, absolutely head over heels in love with her, writing the most passionate letters you can possibly imagine. Um, did this distort his appraisal of what happened with the Lusitania? He himself says that when he was to give a speech in Philadelphia in this period afterwards, that, that he was so caught up in the emotional turmoil of his, his love for this woman, who was not yet returning it. She was not yet certain that this was going to be a, you know, a, 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 a relationship. How many years between the two of them? A lot, right? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. she was, she, yeah. So, so, um, so, so he was, in fact, um, there was this turmoil that he was going through. And when he was in Philadelphia, he, he actually, he, he, to, to, a, to do a speech, he, he wrote that, he, he wrote her that, that he was so caught up in this that he, he for a, a moment, he didn't even remember what city he was in. However, Wilson was the consummate professional um, uh, uh, politician, if you will. Yet he was able to separate the two. Um, and his main, his main thing was he did not want America to go to war. He did not think that America understood the true cost that would come from this particular war. And he was hell-bent on doing everything he could possibly do to keep America out. 
and thus another two years before, in fact, America and got another it. Two years. And then when he finally asked for, uh, for war, um, when he asked Congress, to be, more, to be precise, when he asked Congress to, to authorize um, a declaration that a state of war already existed between Germany and America, he never once mentioned the Lusitania. Too many other things had happened in between. Hmm. Here is an account from one survivor of the Lusitania disaster. Uh, she's on a rescue ship, and she wants to know about the captain. A woman approached Captain Turner and began telling him about the loss of her child. Her voice was low, almost a monotone. She had placed the boy on a raft, she said. Mm -hmm. The raft then capsized, and her son was gone. In the same dispassionate manner, she told Turner that her son's death had been unnecessary, that it was caused by the lack of organization and discipline among the crew. She write about that? Possibly. <laughs> One element of the story. Uh, first of all, wartime. Many of uh, many British sailors had already been uh, uh, well, not no, commandeer is not the right term, but they had they had been required to go into the into the navy and and had wanted to go into the navy. So the the quality of the available crews was not was not the highest, not the most experienced. They did have many experienced crewmen aboard, but the, the overall quality was not not terribly high, but another factor came to play. <clears throat> another factor came to play, and that is that many of the crew were killed instantly when the first, tor when the, when, not, not first, when the torpedo struck, because they were in the luggage hold very near the point of impact, because yet another sort of fluky thing, they were trying to get all the luggage together to bring it up onto deck because the arrival was going to take, in Liverpool was the next day, and they had to get everything, all the luggage prepared. And so many of them were killed. And they were, they were the seamen, the experienced seamen, who would be most capable of launching the boats, lifeboats, safely. So that was all part of the story. But let me follow up on the lifeboat angle, because anybody who saw the Titanic movie remembers they didn't have enough lifeboats, they didn't uh, have life jackets, they couldn't deploy the lifeboats when it came time to doing so. Any of those issues at play with the Lusitania? The, <laughs> interestingly, uh, the Lusitania um, had more than enough lifeboats. That was the issue with the Titanic. They did not have enough lifeboats. And because of the Titanic disaster, major, you know, every, every liner had to have more, had to have enough lifeboats. In the case of the Lusitania, had more than enough lifeboats. And Titanic is just two and a half years earlier. Two and a half years earlier. Um, so it had plenty of lifeboats. But what happened, and, and it, you know, again, talking about the phenomenology of this, this day and, this, and this, this attack, because of the nature <clears throat> of, the, of the, the, uh, the hole in the hull and the inrush of water, the ship almost immediately took on a 25 degree list to starboard, if you can imagine that. And what that effectively meant was that half the lifeboats were unusable, or should have been. People tried to use them and with catastrophic result. What I mean there is that, is that you know, if you think about the ship listing to starboard 25 degrees, the lifeboats on the port side want to lean in against the superstructure. So if you release them, they're coming in, you know, no matter what you do. Those on the starboard side, meanwhile, once lowered to the rails, are going to be hanging out from the hull as much as eight feet. Right. Now, it's, it's scary to begin with if you think about getting into a lifeboat 60 feet above the sea. If you think about trying to span a gap also between you and the lifeboat, it's downright terrifying. Right. Let's do, uh, in our remaining moments here, just some of the odd things about this story. First of all, we've pointed out already almost 10 times as many Brits as American died, and yet it's somehow gone down in history as an American tragedy. Yeah. How come? I'm somewhat at a loss to understand exactly how that all happened. But that, that is, in fact, the way the Lusitania saga is, is taught, um, that it was this really American saga um, and was the thing that got us into the war. Hmm. Um, and I, frankly, I'm a little mystified. I certainly bought into that. The Titanic, two and a half years earlier, has captured the public's imagination like nothing else in maritime history. Not this one. Why, why such a distinction? Uh, you know, another mystery, actually. Uh, and I, I think it has something to do with the fact that it's been pigeonholed as a geopolitical event on the road to on the road to war, that it's it's one part of the big a much bigger story. The Titanic was a self-contained story, right? This is one part of a much bigger story of America on the road, or at least that's the mythology of America on the, on the road to war. Now, part of me thinks that if there had been no Titanic disaster, 
that maybe this would be the thing that James Cameron had made the film on with Leonardo mm -hmm. DiCaprio. You know, maybe he would have been the submarine commander. Right? Who knows? You know, <laughs> but but uh, but it is it is it is interesting to contemplate. They are going to make this into a movie. You know it, eh? I mean, I know it has 50 years ago, but I don't know. Titanic. The Titanic movie is the elephant in the room. Yeah, but. You've done such a great job telling the story. How about this? Where, where is the Lusitania today? It's at the bottom of the sea. Still there? Still there. No efforts like the Titanic to raise it? You know, it's been classified as a national heritage site. It is, in fact, a grave site, you know, and, and, and that is, that's why it's still there. Have people or crews gone down there in a People to have dived down. Yeah. Uh, Robert Ballard did, a, did an exploration from a submersible and took some very interesting photographs, which apparently are online. Um, yeah, so people have, have been fascinated enough to be able to, to go down there and try and solve some of the lingering mysteries. Like one, you know, one mystery, well, not mystery, but one, one, one myth was that it was actually armed with naval guns, and one diver actually claimed to have seen it the barrel of one such gun. But in fact, there were no guns, naval guns, aboard the Lusitania. Hmm. None. We could put that to rest, absolutely. Let's finish up on this. This is not the most deadly nautical disaster in history. <clears throat> it did not make America enter World War I. There were millions upon millions of people who died in World War I in actually equally, if not much more ghastly ways than the people on this ship died. Uh, an odd question to ask somebody who probably spent years of his life working on this, but why should we remember this story any more than others of World War I? Because it's a really good story. It's a really good story. Yeah. You got that right. It really is. And you've told it extremely well. Eric Larson, it's really good of you to spend some time with us at TVO tonight. The book is called Dead Wake, which is a reference to, as you can see on the cover, the way the ocean looks when a torpedo's coming at you. The last crossing of the Lusitania. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.